The losses in Arakan at that time, because the Japanese had invaded Burma and had driven the troops out in the first campaign, and uh, had uh, heavy losses down there, and uh, among officers as well. And they were always on the lookout for officer material, as they said. And I'd been in Calcutta on leave, and when I got back, our chap in the company said uh, while he had been away there was a curious thing happened they said they came round and sort of said in your company who would you recommend as uh, who would make a good officer and they said we'll put your name there said, thank you very much mm. so uh, I said that I didn't uh, want my name to be put forward if the company went into Burma as if you went out of farm but I oh, wasn't going to, not at that stage. So anyway, we finished up in Bhopal, Bhopal State, where we went on to jungle training after we'd done Teleport. There we did all this jungle training, and then one day this information came, 4983960, private LSPG. The above-named man will report to this headquarters in Delhi with the rank of Captain, he will serve as a military observer and conducting officer. Kindly inform this headquarters when he is uh, when, when, when he leaves right. your detachment. What? Right. No, not when he arrived, when he left. So I had to go for this interview, and the commanding officer was very displeased. He said, when he had the opportunity, he said he wouldn't take it in Delhi. Now you've got one, what, is that? what about it? so on and so forth. But the top and bottom of it was it was a, what they call a direct commission. One minute out of private soldier because uh, under war establishment, Lance Corporals had been pretty well done away with and I was company clerk and uh, company clerk typing and uh, keeping records and files and mm -hmm. you know, running, running the office for mm -hmm. Sergeant Major. Mm -hmm. That was a fully trained as an infantry NCO, but I was the only one who could type, so somebody had to do it. And uh, one minute I was a private soldier, the next minute I was a captain. I just went to see the dirty tailor and said, I want three pips on this shoulder and three pips on that. So I gave him the sleeve, pinned him up, put it on, and seat of mess sent for me on some something connected with the company and I started a little bit cocky, came from workshop and uh, I not noticed I got that last slip to mum to read it to <laughs> just the devil and, and so when I went into his stores and I said he sent for me and he said yes and I said he said what he wanted and I just said to him I said when you speak to me you say sir <laughs> I said, I was joking at first, I just pointed, I said, I'm a captain. Anyway, it was a great sensation. Next day, having handed my kit in, I set off for New Delhi and, oh, my dear chap, says this brigadier of the public relations, 
сказать. Да, Мария хорошо присоединил. Great transition from the previous week, and then I found that I looked out some pajamas. <laughs> so I got the dirty that night to make some, and they, of course they'll produce next morning. They're very quick at doing that sort of thing, and then I had to fly down to Camilla. Well, it's in East Pakistan now, it was East Bengal then, that was where 14th Army headquarters were. And uh, I had to report there to the Public Relations Detachment to Colonel Arnold, and I met a Lord Louis Mountbatten's press advisor, Chapel Civilian, he was editor of Sunday Dispatch, it's no more now, Sunday Dispatch, isn't it? And he interviewed me and inquired what I've been up to with newspaper experience and so on. Stayed there about a couple of days, then everything was very hush hush and said I got to fly up to Silhet with Wilfred Martin. So I flew up one very stormy night to Silhet and on the way Wilfred Martin said it's not been released yet but General Wingate's been killed in a plane crash. And we're going up there to sort the PR side of things out. Of course, he was the Deputy Assistant Director of Public Relations. He was a major now, his staff captain. So uh, we had to start from scratch and find tents and this mess, officer's mess that would take us on strength. And, and before it's a bat an eyelid, I was 200 miles behind Japanese lines. I was with Wingate's. Um, Behind. Yeah, behind. Mm. So, of course, it's a complicated business that Wingate had this long range penetration group, and they, his idea was to put down strongholds mm. and strike out from there to uh, hit at the Japs' uh, lines of communication. Mm. And they had this famous place, White City, and it was a, what's called a stronghold on seven little wooded hills. And there were West African and British and Gurkha troops there, and it was my job to go and report on everything that had, was happening and had been happening. And every night, of course, the same in battle report. As soon as dusk came, the Japs came in and tried to break, tried to break the wire down and overrun the place. So. Were we ever involved in any of that? Oh, I was involved in it. I was right in the middle of it. But it was my job to report what was happening and try and get this news out because there was only a light plane strip. There was no Dakota strip at all. It was just light planes for evacuating wounded for when they could get out. And I had to, you know, steer clear of trouble because the chap who was my predecessor, he, um, He'd been killed. He jumped on a grenade in a slip trench and got himself blown up. His, uh, his name was Jack Webb. His, his sister was Kay Webb. And she married Ronald Searle, the uh, Centrinian cartoon chap. And poor old Jack Webb got, his, got himself blown up and I was the next on the list to go. <laughs> I wasn't really, but there were one or two who didn't fancy joined Jindy to thought it was a bit too unhealthy. I wasn't seeing it by any means, so I just got thrown in. And uh, that's where I landed up. What was and the name of the place? White City, they called it. Was it, was a, it was seven wooded hills near a village called Henu. Mm. And you could look out from the edge of the perimeter across at this village about a couple of miles away, and that's where the Japs were entrenched. And every night they came in to these battles and they got what they called a, a coal scuttle aircraft. It, it was their soldiers' word for four-inch mortar. We'd only got two-inch and three-inch, but they got a four-inch mortar. And if you hear this wretched thing poop in the middle of the afternoon and everybody dropped what they were doing and dived into slip trenches and things because a few seconds later over would come this four-inch mortar bomb and land in the treetops and uh, that was their way of showing that they were 
No, but they uh, did everything. They brought into the flock three o'clock about every afternoon this porridge morning to open up. And sometimes the mules got it, and if, of course, the point mortal bomb went into a slip tank, it didn't do you any good. But I always remember there was a, it was very bright moonlight, uh, a full moon, in fact, and it was so bright that at night you could literally read the copy of SIAC newspaper, which was the troops' own newspaper, was printed in Calcutta. And you could read it by, by moonlight outside. You could read all the newsprint quite easily. And uh, Japs had this habit of uh, getting right close up to the wire and calling out, Johnny, where are you? Let me in, and all that sort of thing. All in, all in English. And any defending uh, troops who went up to it, of course, they did not direct them where the opening in the wire was. And before it was back in Harley, they'd have probably been inside playing ducks and drakes with everybody. But anyway, one night, remember me. I had a scuffle. I wasn't sticking my neck out on the perimeter much, but, you know, just making note of everything that was happening. And I had a scuffle in the slip trench, so I got a revolver. Oh, I've got 12 rounds of ammunition. That was all I got. So I took the revolver out and crawled down the slip trench, and it went down the bend. And I could hear somebody coming in at the other side, and I quite thought it was a jack who got infiltrated, you see. And I, you know, I could hear this scuffling, I heard it wasn't rats. And I crawled on my elbows with my revolver, you know, in my hand as best I could, and suddenly I saw two eyes. That was all I could see, two eyes. And I did, I don't know quite what to say. I said, I, I, I don't know, more startled me and the other chap who owned these two eyes. So I said to him, who are you? That sort of thing to say in the middle of a, you know, strong, who are you? And a voice said, sir, I am a citizen of Nigeria. I am a signaler coming off duty. And of course, he was black as coal and his face blended with the slip train. Because they were Nigerian and West Indian, West African troops there as well as Gorkis and British. So I told him he'd better depart rapidly, otherwise he'd get a shot where he didn't expect it. <laughs> and then met, um, I met, uh, well, I had an introduction to uh, Ian Fleming's brother, uh, Peter Fleming, the travel writer. Lieutenant Colonel Peter Fleming, he was with Grenadier's Art. I don't quite know how he got attached to uh, Jindits, but he was there. And Colonel Arnold, who was a publisher, he was the number one, really, in public relations. He said, if you drop across Peter Fleming, give him my kind regards. <laughs> so I met him, and I said, Colonel Arnold, give me a message for you. And he was quite pleased, and he said, if there was anything that I wanted, he'd only to let him know, and this, that, and to that. Everybody was very good. Really, and then there was...